Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Hello, everyone. My name is Jason Levine, Principal Worldwide Evangelist for Adobe. Great to be here today to begin the first in a series of six uh, video-based live streams on how to make great video. So today, it's all about setting up the project, best practices for kind of importing your media, different ways to import your media, how to ingest and transcode and create proxies. And this is for non-video pros, really fundamentally, uh, uh, primarily. So if you're already a video pro, this, think of this as a little bit of a refresher, maybe a couple little things that are new that you haven't seen. If you've never touched Premiere, but you want to sort of get into video editing, this is really for you as well, because I'm gonna take you through all the granular levels of things that you can do to kind of get the best experience, the most delightful editing experience inside this application regardless of what you've shot on. So whether you're working with a DSLR or mirrorless camera or high-end red or airy camera or your iPhone or a GoPro or a drone or even shooting vertical video. So shall we get started? All right, here we go. So the first thing we're going to do, like I said, we're starting from scratch here. These are, these are really the fundamentals of getting started with video working in Premiere Pro. So when you open the application, the first thing you see is this, which is not unfamiliar to a lot of the startup dialogues in Photoshop or Illustrator or pretty much all the CC applications today. So we want to begin a new project. So let's start by clicking on the new project button here. When we do that, we're presented with yet another dialogue. So we're going to give it a name and we'll call this uh, Make Video Day One. Again, part of a six part series. Tell it where we want it to go. So I'm going to save this in a special folder that I made called Six Weeks of Video. And then you're presented with three tabs up here, General, Scratch Disks, and Ingest. Now we're gonna come back to this uh, once we're actually inside of Premiere. What I wanna just first highlight is something called Video Rendering and Playback. Now, Premiere has a couple of different options and this will change depending upon what operating system you're running uh, and uh, um, what kind of uh, video card you have supported in your machine. But basically when you're, when you're working with video in Premiere, we have a lot of different ways to kind of accelerate the process of using effects, uh, of rendering, and just kind of general uh, methods of navigating and moving around footage as you're playing back in the timeline. And we have something called the Mercury Playback Engine, and this is what allows us to play all kinds of footage uh, uh, very efficiently, whether you're working in 4K, 6K, 8K, classic, 1080, full HD, doesn't matter. Now, by default, uh, we have this software only mode, which means that you're not using any GPU acceleration. GPU, of course, re relating to your graphics card. Um, this is fine. And again, depending upon what you're doing, that will probably be enough for most new editors. You don't necessarily have to get into this accelerated realm. However, just wanting to point out here that if you have a machine, Mac or PC, that has an NVIDIA card, specifically one that supports their, is, is, is known as CUDA, and you can see that here, their CUDA architecture, we allow you to leverage that for GPU acceleration, which means that as you add effects and as you work with larger rasters, your performance and playback in the timeline is going to be a little better. Now, on both platforms, Mac and PC, you'll have something called OpenCL available to you. Again, this is kind of an OS-based GPU acceleration. Nice to have. Sometimes software and OpenCL can feel like they're the same performance-wise. You just have to give them a shot. And if you're in a later version, uh, I'm currently using 10.10.5 here on Mac OS. If you're in uh, El Capitan or Sierra, you'll also see an option for Apple Metal, okay? Now, you don't have to change any of this right now. I typically will use CUDA as my default, just pointing out that that's where these things are. Okay, now we also have the ability here to change your display format. Frankly, you never really have to change these. Um, you can see here, you can sort of measure your display format in feet and frames kind of relative to film here or just frames. Time code is pretty much what you want. That's the default. Audio display format, audio samples or milliseconds. That's entirely up to you. Again, audio samples is the default. You're probably not going to want to change that. We're not going to worry about capture here. Not that so many people are capturing, but you just leave it as DV. That's what the default is. All right. Now, scratch disks, I just point this out because this is, again, something familiar to anyone who's worked in design with Photoshop. Um, same concept here. As you're capturing video, as you're capturing or ingesting or importing, and I'll get to those terms in a moment, audio and video, your preview files, um, auto saves, CC libraries downloads, and this includes things like um, Adobe stock content, which I'm gonna cover momentarily. 
You just want to tell Premiere where should all of that go. And by default, and I think in a very elegant way to keep your projects organized, and anyone who works in any kind of design or video knows that project organization is so key, um, by default, it's going to place that content in the folder sort of next to where all of your where you're importing all of your footage, where we kind of started this project. OK, so this is just pointing that out. You can place it anywhere so you can have, you know, your captured video and audio can be on the same in the same location, but you can have your previews and motion graphics media, for instance, uh, captured somewhere else, saved locally on your local SSD or something like that. You can modify it. It works and functions the same way as you know from Photoshop and Illustrator. Just pointing out that that's there. Now, the third tab here is ingest settings. Now, we're going to come back to this in a minute. I don't want to dump this on you right away, but I just want to point out what this is. So what this allows you to do is effectively bring in footage and then either copy it from like a media card or some other external location to another location, to a local drive, to an external drive, or you have the option to transcode that media as well, which basically means convert it to, um, in most cases, converting it to a format that's a bit more optimized for playback, going to give you better playback performance. A lot of the camera formats out there, even some of the ones, even things like you would shoot on your phone, they're compressed. They're known as H.264, MP4, and these can sometimes not have the greatest playback experience, depending upon the system you're working on. So we give you options to convert it to a more optimized file. In this ingest settings uh, panel, you also have the ability to create something called a proxy file, which I'm going to show you again in just a moment. Proxies are effectively smaller, lighter weight versions of your master media, which you can very easily create in the background using Adobe Media Encoder. And then what it will do is it will basically allow you to very quickly swap between this lightweight, easy to work with media and your native media with a single click. That's a lot of information. So those of you taking notes are probably going, oh God, this already seems way too hard. Just pointing it out, we're going to get back to it and we're really going to go through the whole process. All right, here we go. Okay, so let's go ahead now and just begin our project. All right, and here's our sort of default look here. Now at the top, we've got a bunch of workspaces. Now your UI might not look exactly like mine. I've customized some of my workspaces. All right. And you can also access workspaces up in the uh, work window workspaces menu. When I'm importing or ingesting footage, and ingest means just that, it, not, to, not to eat, but just to import your footage, I usually work in the assembly workspace, okay? It just gives me a lot of screen real estate here in the project panel and primarily using something called the media browser. Now, again, if you don't see this docked inside a panel here, you can always go up to the window menu and you can find the media browser here. Now, just to kind of talk a little bit about the UI here, um, this works the same as it does in all of the video apps, pretty much the same as it does in Photoshop and Illustrator, where if you have one of these tab views, you see I can kind of click on this and I can drag it around and change its position sort of up in this window here. This is a stack of different panels. If I click on the little flyout menu here, I have some options to close this panel. I can undock the panel so that it's free floating. So for those of you who work in dual or triple monitor setups, I know most people sort of have things spread out all over. Um, I work with one monitor, so I kind of have to optimize my look on screen. Um, if you want to drag it back in, you can simply click the edge here, and then you see you get these little drop zones. So I want it to go at the top of the bar here, let it go, and there it is, okay? And it's very easy to rearrange and reorganize. Additionally, once you have a workspace that you like, you go back to the Workspaces menu here. Again, anyone who's done this, it's going to look pretty familiar to you. The process is effectively the same. You can always reset to the saved layout. This is good because we tend to change things and move things around as we bring in different types of footage. You can also save the changes to that workspace, so actually push any of the changes that you just made or modified, or you can just clearly save a new one entirely, all right? So workspaces are very, very um, useful when kind of starting the process of importing video, all right? Now, oftentimes what I'm going to show you here is that I will often drag things from the media browser to the project panel. So what is the media browser? Well, it's just that. Think of it effectively, if you're coming from the design background, it's kind of like a more advanced video specific version of bridge. Um, and by that, I simply mean that here you can see I'm in a folder, I can access all of my my drives. So I've got a couple of external spinning drives. 
I've also got a media card for my Nikon D800 here. And as I navigate to different folders, I can bring in different pieces of content. So here we have all of our video thumbnails. Now, just like Bridge, you'll notice here at the bottom, you have this zooming capability here. You also have the ability to view this as a list view. Oh, sorry, my camera's in the way there and you can't really see it. Let me move it over. Uh, you have the ability to view this as a list view or as a thumbnail view. If you choose the thumbnail view, that makes the most sense because again, I can use the resizer down here at the bottom. We're just zooming in again so you can see that right here. And as I drag this, you see that everything starts to get bigger. So I realize my lower third's kind of cutting that off right there. Make these bigger so we can see them larger on screen. This is the way that we're going to begin to sort of review any kind of footage that we've shot, all right? So as I hover my mouse over footage, you'll see that it begins to play back. So this is known as hover scrubbing. So this function basically allows me to see what's inside of every clip. Now, why is that important? Well, you know, a lot of times, not unlike photography, we shoot a lot more video than we, pro than we probably need these days, largely because we can, right? Because the media cards are big enough and easy enough to work with. So we just shoot a lot of stuff. So there might be a couple clips here that, you know, aren't very good. They're very, they're all handheld, but maybe they're too shaky and I don't want them. So this just gives me a quick way to kind of review the content before I even begin editing, before I do anything with it. So here, I'm gonna to navigate to another folder here. Maybe something with some a little more colorful footage here. Just something maybe a little cooler or retro old school. So here's some footage that I shot for this, uh, a documentary that I still haven't finished about early synthesis <laughs> in the uh, analog to digital in the early 80s, sort of making the move from analog to digital. So again, I can again hover over this content, see what's inside these clips. You can also click on a clip. And when you do that inside the media browser, you'll see now that you get this little playhead, which means that I can click and drag this and I can now scrub through the performance rather than hovering over it. I'm actually just clicking and holding down my left mouse button here and kind of scrolling through all of this, all right? Very simply. Now, if there's a portion of the footage specifically that I like, I can also make what we call in and out points, kind of make my selections right here if you want to. Now, I'm pointing that out. We're gonna come back to that later when we really get into editing. Um, and the way that you do that very simply is by hitting I for in, I hit the space bar, I can play it back. Got a little sort of rack focus there. And O for out. And now I've got this specific section here that I would effectively like to use or like to edit with, okay? So I and O to do that. So as we move through all of this footage, again, we can hover over it and decide what it is that we want to do. So if I simply wanted to just bring in the entire clip as it is, again, a couple of simple shots here, I can select this, I can hold down my command key on the Mac, or is it uh, control on, 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 on Windows? So I can select these four clips and I can do one of two things. I can right click or control click on them and choose to import them. And if I do that, it's simply going to bring this content directly into Premiere Pro, or I can also drag. Now this, I show you this because it's a little, it's a little strange how you do it, but this is where you could also have your media browser and your project panel side by side. Premiere Pro's project panel is where you're going to be able to always see all the media that's in your project, right? Really simple. So I can take this content and I can click and I'm hovering over the project panel here. And when I move my mouse into this import media box, do you see how it went to a, a plus sign? So at the top here, plus sign, let go, and it imports my media. And now all of this media is inside the project. That's bringing in footage just simply by clicking and dragging. Now again, if we go back to the media browser here. Let's go to some different media. Just trying to switch up the visuals here to make this more interesting for y'all. Uh, this is some stuff that I shot with the D800 of my uh, Moog Rogue synth. Again, it's part of this documentary. Just to show you the alternate way, selecting two clips here, right click, import, okay? In lieu of just clicking and dragging. I find oftentimes that's sort of a bit more elegant and a bit easier. Click back over to my project panel and there are those clips. Now, the reason you're seeing multiples here is that some of these I'd already made sub clips in them. Let's not even worry about that, but that's why they're four in case you're wondering. 
but the footage is now in this project. And by the way, in the project panel, you'll notice again, um, you have that same hover scrub functionality. So I'm not clicking anything. I'd say no hands, but otherwise I can't move my mouse. I'm just moving my magic mouse over this. And as I hover over it, it plays it back. And you can see the playback performance is, it's really nice. It's really smooth, okay? Let's talk about the ingest though, and making copies and making proxies, because it starts to get a little bit more complex when you're working with sort of larger media and sort of things like vertical media, particularly if you're working on a laptop or maybe a slower system. Now, again, I'm showing you all this because there are lots of different ways to import that media and import from cards. For instance, if we go to my D800 media card. So I just shot this before we began. Now, one of the cool things that Premiere does is that we actually allow you, you could theoretically edit right off the media card. You don't ever actually have to copy it over. So when I was just dragging that footage from the media browser into the project panel, I didn't copy anything. I just basically made a reference to wherever that media already lived in Premiere's project panel, right? I didn't say copy this to this drive and place it over here. I didn't do any of that. It still lived, lives wherever it lives. Premiere is just referencing that footage. But sometimes you want to actually make a copy. For instance, if I'm working off of a media card, uh, I don't want to edit on my SD card. You can. Premiere will let you. Um, performance is pretty good. But typically, you're going to want to actually copy something over uh, to, a, to another location for sort of as a best practice. So again, here's a case where I want to pull this off of the media card, but I also want to copy it. I want to transcode it. Um, maybe I just want, or maybe I just want to copy it from, you know, QuickTime movie to QuickTime movie, not even convert it to something else. By the way, again, I can click in here. Now this footage has some audio. I go ahead and play this back. Oh, and here, let me make sure my settings are proper. I'll get to these settings too in just a moment. No, we're going to change these. All right. We'll talk about that. Okay. If you're not hearing anything, okay. Uh, as you bring in your media, you got to make sure that you have the correct audio hardware set up. So up at the top here on Mac, Premiere Preferences Audio Hardware. On Windows, that's going to be Edit Preferences Audio Hardware. Go into Audio Hardware and just make sure that you have the correct inputs and outputs set. Now, I've got a built-in microphone and speakers on my laptop that I'm working from, but actually all the sound that we're doing here is coming from an external device of mine called the Focusrite Thunderbolt. At, and make sure that this is consistent across anything. Now, sample rate, typically for video, you're going to be working in 48K, 48,000 hertz. Let me move that up so you can see it better there. So let's go ahead and select. It'll switch over. Your buffer size. Now, this defaults to different things on Windows and Mac. You can see here the default is 512. Um, what is a buffer size for audio? Well, effectively, that's kind of the, think of that as the pre-roll time that it takes between you hitting play and the sound coming out of those speakers. It buffers a little bit of that so that it can play everything without any kind of glitching or stopping or <coughs> hiccuping or anything like that. The higher the buffer size, gen generally, the better your playback will be. So if you're ever experiencing digital glitching or, or hiccuping, um, increase the buffer size. The downside to that is that the higher the buffer size, the more delay it is from the time that you hit play to when playback begins, or in the case of doing something like a voiceover, there's going to be some implied delay there as well. So it's really about finding the sweet spot there. Now, um, on the Mac side, you can see I'm at about 128 samples for my buffer size. This is a recommended setting for pretty much all internal or external sound cards. This tends to work pretty well. Again, if you find that your playback, you're getting little or hiccups when you're just playing back, try increasing that to the next level up. Uh, on the Windows side, I believe we measure this in milliseconds. So again, you're, you want to be you want to be as low as you can go without sort of experiencing any dropouts or artifacts or clicking or anything like that. All right, so let's zoom back out of here. Click OK. Wind this back, and again, I'm going to hit my space bar. Okay, quick test so that I have a couple of items on the card. All right. You're off and off. Okay. So I now want to bring this in, but specifically I want to copy this from that media card and place it in my project folder so that it's organized, right? I'm going to take it off the media card, place it where all this other stuff will ultimately go, 
and start working. So this is where we're now going to use this ingest button here. And again, we could have set this up when we made the new project as well. I think it's just a little bit more elegant in here and you'll see why in just a moment. So if you click on the wrench menu, this allows you to now open your ingest settings. Notice it's the same box that we saw before. So let's click on ingest. Now, when you go inside this dialog here, you've got a couple of different options. Copy, transcode, create proxies, copy and create proxies, okay? Now, copy is just that. It's gonna take the media, for instance, this is again, D800 media on an SD card, and it's gonna take what it is in the format that it is and just copy it over to some other location, which you can see down here if I move this over. It's gonna go right into that folder where sort of the project file lives. This is good, this is good for uh, project and file organization, keep everything together. Now, transcoding, what is transcoding? Well, again, anyone who's worked with Lightroom, when you shoot RAW and you're shooting NEF or CR2 or uh, whatever Sony's RAW image format is, <laughs> when you bring them into Lightroom, you know, we recommend you want to convert your files to DNG, right? Your digital negative. That's kind of the standard for working with RAW media um, and converting that you know, native Nikon or, or Sony or Canon format into this kind of universal standard DNG. And it preserves the bit depth and all the quality of your files in RAW. Well, transcoding for video is the exact same concept. You can convert it to another format, which for video, for working with video in Premiere, typically you might choose something like Apple ProRes if you're on the Mac side. Or cross-platform, we offer something called GoPro Cineform, which is a high bit rate, uh, 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 12 bit depth file format that's going to, again, preserve all the quality of the original file, but convert it to something that's a bit more standard and also optimize for playback. You can even transcode to things like H.264 and lots of other different formats. So if you wanted to do that, we could choose transcode and you'll see that we give you a whole bunch of different options here. Now to the, to the novice editor, you know, probably looking at some of these and going, what is ABC intro DNX? By the way, this is like the AVID standard file format, IMX, XAVC, XDCAM. These are just suggestions. You can make different ingest presets inside the media encoder, and we'll cover that in another lesson. Um, but this is, again, this concept if you wanted to convert it to something else. Like I said, if you actually want to get serious um, and keep you know, the highest quality version possible, I would recommend cross-platform to go to something like GoPro Cineform. Um, these files are going to be big, though. They're not small. They're not compressed like an H.264. Um, now this is high bit rate, so it's gonna be good quality, but remember, if you're shooting on a DSLR or mirrorless camera in H.264 or .mp4, it's already a compressed file format. So if you copy it to another compressed file format, you're degrading the image. How does that relate to photography? Well, same as if you were working in a really high quality JPEG, but then you save it as a JPEG again, even though it's high quality, you're, you're losing a little bit. But if you're working in, you know, 14-bit TIFF and you save it as TIFF, or again, you're working in DNG and resave as DNG, you don't lose anything. That's what GoPro Cineform will give you. That's what Apple ProRes will give you. That's what DNX will give you. But again, most of you probably won't, won't even bother with that. Okay, so for this footage, I don't need to transcode it. I'm going to leave it in its native file format. I'm simply going to copy it. And again, I can tell it where I want it to go. Same as project. You can, of course, determine where you want it to go, a preset destination. You can save this to Creative Cloud if you want. You could save it to Dropbox by choosing your own location. I highly recommend if you're gonna be working on this footage, ultimately to keep it on some kind of local drive and preferably the fastest drive that you have on your system. So I'm gonna click OK. So now what happens is when I right click and import this footage, it imports, but what also happens is it's actually making a copy of this to my local drive, and you can see it's already here, ready to go. Again, I can click inside this, play this back. Okay, quick test so that I have a couple of items on the card. Okay, and the footage is already in here, very simply. Now, I'm not gonna talk too much about keyboard shortcuts today, but um, just a couple that are very, very useful for you. JKL. J, K to pause or stop so that I have a L couple of items on. Um. This works inside the project panel. It works inside the media browser. It works inside a sequence. If you were to go JJ, so twice, 
Double speed. LL. Okay, quick test so that I have a couple of items on the card. Double speed, and so on and so forth. You'll also notice that while it does that, it does a it maintains pitch, which is kind of a nice feature as opposed to the well, the, the more traditional way of scrubbing, where as you speed up and you know, the pitch raises, right? It gets kind of Mickey Mousey. This kind of preserves that pitch, which actually makes it easier to review footage fast if you're looking for a good take or something like that. So that was copying the media. And the media, as you can see, actually, what happened was in the background, it had launched Media Encoder CC, and it basically just made a copy of that same movie file to that location in my six weeks of video folder, okay? So now that's one of the essential things with Media Encoder is that it does a lot of stuff in the background, which is super cool and very useful so that, again, it doesn't really break the workflow. Let's continue to bring in a couple more pieces of footage here. I just wanted to show you this because we've been getting a lot of asks about this. So this is just some stuff that I shot uh, earlier this morning on my iPhone. So this is some 4K vertical video. Now, again, it wasn't too long ago where if you talked about vertical video to a video editor, they kind of did the... <laughs> it was kind of the equivalent of using Comic Sans in design. It isn't anymore, largely thanks to things like Snapchat, but many of our social publishing networks we, we consume vertical video all the time. You know, it's much easier to look at your phone like this than like this. I mean, that's just how, that's how, we, that's how we talk. That's how we're typing. So vertical is a thing. It's great. And of course, it's fully supported in Premiere. So again, if I wanted to just copy this media, um, again, because I've got ingest already selected. And by the way, once you click this box for the project, this is at the project level. Okay, so... It's different, you have to enable it for every project. It's not going to be on now indefinitely. Um, but once it's enabled, if I click this, again, I'll just drag this video over, all right, place it into my project. Now it lets me see it there immediately. That's kind of the cool thing with Premiere is that I can actually begin working with this right away. In the background, if we go to Media Encoder, oh look, it's already done. <laughs> so there's, you can see the file name, IMG3647. It already, it already copied it over, and now it's in the project. And more importantly, it's in, a, it's in the project folder where all the media lives, okay? Now, uh, again, I don't really need to go into all of these things. The process for 360 video, exactly the same. This is some content uh, that uh, a buddy of mine, Jared Hillhouse, uh, allowed me to use. This was shot on a, uh, a Nikon Key mission. It's 360, so same concept here. Uh, if I want, I can simply import this, drag it in, uh, bring it in, and it'll allow me to start working with this footage. Okay. Now, at this point, we can actually start making a sequence, and we're gonna, talk, we're gonna come back to proxies, so don't worry, we've got 26 minutes. Um, right now, we've got all this footage in our timeline, and we can actually start the process of editing. So if I wanted to simply begin making a timeline, just start working, first of all, like I mentioned before, the project panel, I'm viewing everything visually here. Whoops, I'm viewing everything visually here. So if we go down to the bottom, can I, make, can I scroll this up more so you can see? There we go. So I'm in, the, I'm in the icon view. We've also got the list view, okay? So this is list view. This doesn't really help me, it doesn't tell me anything. Although I do have all of this metadata here. What is this metadata? Well, this metadata is telling us the frame rate, the duration, the frame size, so again, here you can see this piece right here, our vertical video, right? So this one is 2160 by 3840. We can expand these. This is showing you the pixel aspect ratio, the audio, etc. okay? Shows you all the elements here. This view, it's just much nicer. And again, this is also resizable with that little resizer at the bottom of the project panel. And again, as you hover over, these things will play back and you can actually see the content playing live, okay? You also have, up at the top of the project panel here, um, I usually now keep this hidden, but I like it sometimes, something called the preview area. I just point this out because what's cool about this is as you click on a piece of footage, it just very quickly gives you like the display of what it is. You can also preview it here. This is, we kind of joke that this, this little window hasn't been redesigned in a long time, but it just kind of shows you the attributes of the footage very, very quickly. All right, especially like in the case of this, where you can see this is our vertical video, 2160 by 3840. 
its duration, 10 seconds, 22 frames. It was shot at 30 frames per second, and the audio is at 44.1. If we want to, again, start a timeline here, how do we do that? Well, there's a couple of different ways, as always. First of all, traditionally, um, most people might think, well, let's go to File New. And if you go to File New, you will see that we have lots of different options here. So we can make a new project, team project, which is a collaborative editing workflow, make a new sequence. So sequences is where your video footage lives, okay? You hear me say timeline, timeline, sequence. These things are effectively interchangeable. We, we, we use them, they mean the same thing, okay? You can build a new sequence from clip. You can create new bins, search bins, adjustment layers, legacy title. We'll talk about that in a future, uh, future episode. You can also make Photoshop files. Why do I just point this out here? Because Premiere Pro, of course, works natively with PSDs. So if you've got a layered Photoshop file that you want to import into Premiere Pro, and you want to be able to say, select certain layers that you're going to use for graphical elements or overlays or lower thirds, it works natively with them. You never have to flatten, even if you have animation in your Photoshop file. That's preserved when you bring it over to Premiere. Layer styles, layer sets, all of those things are supported. And this is also where you can make things like bars and tone, um, black video, captions, uh, transparent video, color mats and such. Again, we'll get to that in another episode. So file new. Um, I never go there, though. I never go to file new to make a sequence. Why? Because it's a lot easier and you've got a couple different ways to do it. First of all, if I simply wanted to take all this footage here, but I wanted it to be in a different order, one of the nice things is working in this thumbnail view is that you can simply click and drag and reorder the content. And this kind of becomes your visual storyboard. So if I wanted to import this footage like this, let's say these first six clips, so you can see I've got Moog, Casio, Moog, Casio, Moog, Casio. When they're in this order, I can simply select all of them and I can right click or control click, and I can choose new sequence from clip. When I do that, it automatically builds a sequence for me in the correct frame size, at the correct frame rate, with the correct pixel aspect ratio. Now, what, why is that significant? Well, first of all, um, it prevents you from having to do it manually, because if you go to File, New, Sequence, or if you were to use the new item button down here at the bottom, this one, new item, where you can also make a new sequence. This is very useful because this has sequence presets for all different types of media. So again, I mentioned like Arri cameras before. You can see we've got presets for both uh, 1080p and 2880p, um, DSLR. So 1080p in various frame sizes. And again, that's 1920 by 1080. That's standard full HD. Um, a, lot of, a lot of DSLRs and a lot of your cameras still shoot 720p. Um, you'll even notice in this latest version of Premiere, we have new presets for VR workflows, whether you're working monoscopically or stereoscopically, you know, with HD, 4K, and even 8K presets. Because yes, Premiere Pro supports all of these massive raster sizes. Um, we were the first to do native 4K. We go all the way up to 10,000 by 10,000 pixels here. So if we get to 10K, we're already set to do that. 8K is enough, frankly. Um, so you've got all these presets here. The reason I don't often go into this menu is, especially if you're new to this, especially if you're coming from design or you're not a video editor, what if you don't know what the, do you know? Who knows what the, uh, what the frame size is, or more importantly, the frame rate of the footage they're shooting on their Android? If you do, that's awesome, but you don't have to go here. This, what's nice here is that you just have a bit more options to kind of customize your settings if you want. What can you customize? Well, you can customize things like the editing mode, which you can see here. And there are lots of different editing modes. You can customize the time base. Again, if you know the frame rate, you can customize uh, the actual video frame size, the audio sample rate, Video previews. So these are preview files as you're applying effects and things that, again, can kind of speed up your workflow, and we'll come back to that. And also uh, enable certain properties when working with VR. What's easier? Like you just saw, select a bunch of clips, right-click on the first one, new sequence, and it does all the work for you. Very simple. Very, very easy. Very, very elegant. And when you do that, you'll see down below here, if I zoom in now, just moving over so you can see the icon. 
this indicates that this is a sequence. And you can see it gives you a little tooltip here, sequence, all right? So I brought this footage in. Now inside of our sequence, by the way, you can see that this is just, it took the name of that first clip. So I usually like to rename these things. If I just uh, select this here, the sequence, right click on it and just, I'm going to choose rename and we'll call this uh, synths01, just so it changes the name. Now, when I play this back, and by the way, if you hover your mouse over your video tracks or audio tracks, I'm using this gesture, watch what happens. Oh, whoops, I just zoomed it way off the screen there. Um, you can zoom the track height, okay? Now, something else to point out here, just in terms of what you're seeing. We haven't even played anything back because there's just so many things that you can modify to, again, improve the playback performance and experience. Uh, you'll see here that you have some options to like show video thumbnails, show video keyframes, show video names. You can disable all of those things, similarly for the audio files. Also, in the sequence flyout menu, you have options here, specifically with video, to show Zoom out here. Video head and tail thumbnails, just the head thumbnail, continuous video thumbnails. Now, why does that matter? Why am I wasting any time on this? Well, for really like best, fastest performance when you're bringing footage in, just trying to cut something, it's visually kind of nice to see the whole sort of sequence filled up with video like that. It isn't necessary because you're really just seeing a still frame. So typically, I'll just do video head thumbnail. And this is the difference there. You'll see as you zoom in, like, you're only seeing this, right? That's the first frame of that clip. This is the first frame of that clip. Notice how I can click and drag. I'm, I'm, I'm scrolling around here with these little scroll bars at the bottom here, okay? It's moving our timeline. It's really entirely up to you. Uh, I tend to like to see, again, I think it just, it looks better to see continuous video thumbnails, but there is a slight, a slight minimal performance hike. And again, it depends on how much footage you've got in your timeline because it has to redraw all those. And you notice that every time I zoom in or out, you actually start to see more frames. So keep that in mind. If things are kind of getting a bit slow, a bit sluggish, you can disable a lot of that stuff and your performance is just going to be better. Let's go ahead and build a sequence. And... Uh... I'm going to choose, because this was DSLR 1080p24, I'm just going to choose this default preset here, okay? And I'm quickly going to rename this. And I know you can't see that because my camera's right there. I'm going to call this test. And you'll see it changes right here to test, okay? So I'm going to take a piece of footage that I already know is in the same, oops, same frame rate and frame size. I'll take this right here. And I'm just clicking and dragging to bring these in. Left click and drag, okay? By the way, more keyboard shortcuts that are useful. Plus and minus. We all know this from pretty much every other Adobe application for in and out, zooming in and out. That's how I'm zooming in on the timeline here, plus and minus. Also on the US keyboard, the backsplash key kind of fills the view of your sequence with all the video in your timeline. Uh, this is a 1080p 24 frame timeline. If I take this vertical video, this camera's really in the way today. If I take the vertical video here and I drag this into that timeline, what's going to happen is it's going to allow me to place it in there. And in this case, this was 4K. So you can see it's actually filling the whole frame. We don't even see it as vertical anymore. You have a couple of different options here to sort of scale it to the frame size, something like that. But now you see we've got this pillar boxing here. Let me show you something else. Let's take out all this footage. Let me go ahead and start by dragging in that 4K footage into this 1080 timeline. When I do that, now this is to your question, Peter, Premiere actually says, hey, the clip doesn't match the sequence's settings. Do you want to change the sequence to match these clip settings? Well, no, because I know I want this sequence to be 1080, regardless of whether I'm using vertical, regardless of whether I bring in 4K, regardless of whether I, uh, regardless of whether I um, am working in some other raster size or, or square video, whatever it is, okay? How do you increase audio height in the timeline? Same way, uh, uh, Sandrine. So again, if you're, uh, and I'm gonna keep existing settings here. If you take your mouse 
and you simply, by the way, you can click and drag. There's little dividers here. I don't know if you can see them. And you can click and drag on these dividers and adjust the height. But since a few versions ago, if you just gesture over, and I'm using my finger gesture on the magic mouse here, or if you've got a wheel mouse, it automatically resizes uh, accordingly. If you hold down shift and command, let me make this full screen for a second. I'll turn off my camera, get that out of the way here. Bear with me for one second here. Turn off the camera. Hold down shift and command or shift and control. You'll see that it'll, it'll scale up uh, multiple tracks simultaneously. And it's actually quite smooth. There's even like a little bit of ease in there. Same on the video side. So that's holding shift and command very nicely. That looks really kind of elegant. Maybe. Okay. All right. So that's bringing in footage. That's allow showing you how there could be a mismatch. Now, let's go ahead and play this back and just kind of see how this is performing. Now, inside of your program monitor, this is where you're going to view whatever you have in your sequence or in your timeline. You'll notice here down towards the bottom left, we have something called select playback resolution. Now, what is that? So this is, again, something that leverages what we call fractional playback resolutions in Premiere to give you better playback performance. Um, if you have this at full, what this means is that it's going to play back full quality every pixel right here in the program monitor. And I'm just going to mute my sound for a minute. If I go ahead and play, now again, this is all handheld, but it looks really nice. And I'm not dropping any frames, meaning I'm seeing every frame. How do I know that? Well, this little green dot that you see here, this is our dropped frame indicator. Now, if that goes anything other than green, it means you're dropping frames. How do you enable that? That's not on by default. You're gonna find that in the settings menu over here, and you'll see show dropped frame indicator. I like to leave this on, particularly when I'm look looking at things, you know, very sort of critically. This is a good way to know if you're dropping any frames. Now, again, this is on my laptop, so maybe I can't play back, you know, 4K full and full quality, which if I'm editing, it doesn't really matter. Well, you've got two different settings. You actually have the playback resolution and the paused resolution. So you can say when I'm playing back or scrubbing through the timeline, if you find that things are sluggish, drop this down to half or even quarter resolution, okay? But the pause, you can leave it full. So when you stop, you're seeing every pixel, full quality, but the playback here, maybe I want it at one quarter. And this is particularly uh, useful, again, if you're working in greater than, than 1080p, greater than 2K, especially on laptops, even on desktops, just to get better scrubbability, okay? As well as just general playback performance. So now when I play this, you'll notice at quarter res, it looks, it looks a, little, uh, a little more pixelated. Actually, that one looks pretty good still. Um, it's a little more pixelated, but when I stop, it sharpens up, okay? That's because we're playing back at one quarter res, pausing at full res. This is completely non-destructive. Again, if you've done video in Photoshop, you have that little uh, uh, menu there. It's the same concept. You're dropping the play. Basically, you're just seeing one quarter of the pixels or half of the pixels. It's just a bit more optimized. And again, it's just gonna give you better performance when you're actually playing back. All right, so fractional playback, make adjustments here if you find that your playback is choppy or you're not getting the performance that you really want. Okay, so what about making proxy files? All right, let's go into some footage here, something different. All right, and here's some footage that I shot with some friends in Amsterdam for my Jace's Places series. Okay, now this footage is all uh, Canon C100 4K. And again, my machine doesn't love trying to uh, play that back real time. So in this case, I'm going to change my ingest settings to copy and create proxies. Now I've already copied this off to a, a, a location, a local drive. It's not coming off a media card. So I'm simply going to create a proxy. And again, what is a proxy? A proxy is a lightweight, leaner version of your media that's just going to perform better when you're cutting. The cool thing is, is that your proxy files are instantly interchangeable between this lower resolution, smaller media, and the high resolution media with a single click. And I'm gonna show you that right now. When you go into your presets, you're going to see some standard frame sizes that will conform to a lot of the standard larger frame sizes. So this footage is in 
uh, Ultra HD 3840 by 2160. So in that case, I would want to use something like this 1280-720 flavor of proxy presets. Now, and again, in another episode, it's because it's a bit more on the technical side, we'll talk about making more ingest presets, but these will conform to most of your common formats. And again, the proxy can really be anything. It's just a, it's just a smaller, lighter weight version of the file. The frame size, in many cases, if you're just cutting, I mean, it matters, but it's not, it's not the most essential part of this. But these do relate directly. Uh, 3840, 2160, 1287, 20 is an exact, uh, 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 it's, it's a multiple of those. So I can choose to go to ProRes 422. Again, I'm on the Mac side. Again, more cross-platform, GoPro Cineform, or H.264. Some people like H.264 proxies. Obviously, those are going to be the smallest of the three that we show you here. Um, it's just that sometimes your machine may not love playing those back, but they will be small and they'll be lighter weight. GoPro Cineform, it's going to retain the quality, but it'll be in a smaller frame size. In this case, a 720p versus 2160p. So let's say I wanted to use a GoPro Cineform proxy. Where do I want it to go? Again, same as the project, okay? And it's gonna place it in that same folder where we've been placing everything, okay? So let's go ahead and click okay. So all we've done is tell it that we wanna actually make proxies now. So when I select my footage, now this clip here happens to be three seconds. So this is a good clip. Now this one here, this is two and a half seconds. Let's go and play this back. All right, that's pretty good. This is also, these. you can see these are all really super short clips. So again, if I wanted to make proxies of these, I could just select them as they are and bring them in. You also have the ability in Media Browser now to actually make sort of make your selections, your in and out points, and then leverage those when you're working in the timeline. So if I wanted to use this portion of the footage or just have it marked in the clip, and this portion of the footage, I can use those I and O keys to set my in and my out. In this case, making a two second sort of selection of this, and it will create that as well, okay? So I can select multiple clips here. Let's go ahead and import these as we did, or we could drag them into the project, uh, project panel. And it'll bring that footage in. Now, here's where this gets really cool because once again, now, um, if I were, let's first, let's just reorganize these. I'm gonna bounce over to Media Encoder to show you that you can see it just now popped everything into Media Encoder and everything is going to start, uh, it's going to start creating those proxy files. You can see it's generating them right now in the background. Premiere, however, lets you take this footage even before it's made those proxies. Let's go ahead and make a new sequence from clip and you can start editing right away. And when the proxies are generated, those lower, uh, lower resolution, smaller versions of, that of those files, it swaps them out automatically. Like there's, no, there's nothing to it. It just works like that. Now, how do you know if you're working in proxies? Well, there's two things you're going to need to do. First of all, we have a button that needs to be enabled down here in the program monitor or the source monitor. And you can access buttons that you don't see by going to the button editor here. So let's go ahead and choose this plus sign, the button editor. And the button that we're looking for is this one called toggle proxies, all right? So I'm gonna go ahead and drag this down to add it to my buttons in the program monitor and I'll click okay. Now, again, in this thumbnail view, you have no way of knowing that you're working with proxy files. So how do I verify that I'm actually working with proxies? Well, there's two ways. First of all, let's switch over to the list view. And again, right away, I don't see that I'm working with proxies. Now, I'm, if I scroll over all this metadata here, again, I'm using a little gesture, you'll actually see that we have a proxy status um, metadata field here. And it now shows me that using 422LT, that was the flavor I chose, we actually have proxies attached that are online for all of this footage, which means that it's currently using those for all of these clips that we just brought in, okay? Now, if you don't see that option, click on the flyout menu to the project panel here and go into metadata display. Oh, this sounds like it's starting to get very technical. Well, there are some things in here that you do kind of need to know. This is where you're gonna find them. So the metadata display, again, not unlike Bridge and some of our other apps, shows you kind of all this pertinent info about your clips, frame rate, duration, video info, et cetera. 
It's all contained largely here in Premiere Pro Project Metadata. And if you twirl this down, now you can see all the various things that you can view when you're in that list view. And all the way towards the bottom, here's where you see the option to see proxy status. So you want to check that box if you want to verify it here. You don't have to have it verified there. Just showing you that that's where it is. By the way, you can see that what I did, I actually made a metadata display collection called preferred just by enabling that and the video codec and I saved it to a new name. Okay, the default, it's not in there. Okay, so that's how you reveal it there. Now, how do we know that we're working with proxies in the timeline here? All you have to do is click this toggle proxy button and when it turns blue, we are now working off of proxy files. So when I play this back, performance is smooth. It's brilliant. We're not dropping any frames. Again, this is 4K, sourced, sourced 4K now working in a 1280 proxy, full, you know, and, and it performs really nicely. I can probably obviously play this back at full quality because it's, uh, it's uh, a proxy file. And sure enough, not dropping any frames. I'm going backwards. Everything looks good. Now, what if I want to see or I want to export and I want to use the native media? How do I go to native media? Click that box again. When it's gray, you're working off of native media. When it's blue, you're working off of a proxy. That's it. It's that simple. Now, for those of you who have worked in video and maybe you've made proxies in Prelude or maybe you're bringing in proxies from something like Avid or Final Cut, can you attach proxies after the fact? Yes, you can. You can attach lighter weight, transcoded versions of your media directly without going through that ingest dialog. So if you right click on any clip or series of clips in the project panel, you'll see that we have a proxy menu here and you have the option to create, attach, or reconnect media. This is kind of the old school way. You don't really need to do that so much anymore. But here's how you can create them directly or attach them from a third party source. Now, the very last thing I wanted to show you here, because we talked about bringing in footage, and again, this will respect this idea of proxies and everything, is working with um, Adobe Stock content. So let's say I wanted some additional footage of Amsterdam. So I'm going to search on Adobe Stock, and we've got our filtered search here where you can see I'm just returning results for video. In this latest release, we also offer hover scrubbing of your clips. So you can see as I hover my mouse over this video, which it's pulling from the web, I can actually see what's going on in there. All right. If I want to bring this footage in, again, I have the option directly here to license it to one of my libraries, or I can simply download a preview just to see if it works. When I download a preview of this content, what that does is much like, uh, much like what we just saw with the other footage, you can see now it's been added to my stock videos, my collection here in this particular library called Jason's library. When I choose to add this media, to the project, what actually happens is because we have that option to create the proxy enabled, that's what it's going to do. It's going to download the footage, which it just did. It's going to import the file. And then again, in the background, there it goes. You can see right there, it just got sent to media encoder. It's now going to begin encoding the proxy. And it's already done for that footage. So now when I go into the project panel, there it is click it, drag it down into my timeline, hit spacebar to play, and there's our footage. Now look, this was, uh, <laughs> so this was uh, some 1080p, but again, this is a 4K timeline. So how can we fix that real quickly? And again, this will we'll get more when we get into editing. Right click, scale to frame size, that's all you need to do, all right? And now we've got that blown up. Now do you wanna blow up 1080 to 4K? Generally, no, but, Actually, as you can see in the case of this, it actually looks okay. It's going to be footage dependent. You never, you know, you, I don't typically recommend that, but you can absolutely do that. Obviously, better to scale down than scale up. Um, but 1080 to 4K can look okay. 720 to 4K, it might get a little soft, and that's where you'd want to use something like detail preserving upscale in After Effects. The very last thing here, creating bins to organize your footage. Footage organization. Very important. So once again, at the bottom of the project panel here, you have this button, new bin. So I can create a bin and I can call this synths. And then I'll make another bin and I'll call this Amsterdam. And then I'll make another bin. Oh, and I'm making bins inside a bin. Sorry, if I want to drag it outside of, I just drag it all the way to the bottom. And then I'll make another bin. 
and we'll call this 360. So now I can simply take my footage, all these DSCs or synths, and place them in the synth folder. And I'll take all of these AO36s and place them in Amsterdam. And I'll take my stock content and place it in Amsterdam. And I'll take all this Casio stuff and I'll also place this in synths. And I'll take this one here and place it in 360. Okay. And now we just have everything organized very cleanly into bins. All of these that you see here, these are all sequences, right? Tells you it's a sequence, tells you the frame size of the sequence. All right, this one again at Ultra HD. And then you've got all of your footage nicely organized there. So my friends, that is all the time we have today. Thank you so much for joining me for part one, all about importing, ingesting, transcoding, proxy creation, fractional playback, metadata, sequence settings, and a couple other things that I'm probably forgetting. Bin creation, new items, creating Photoshop files. That's the basis. Thanks, everyone. Thanks again. We'll see you next time. Take care.